Welcome everyone. It's the sixteenth of June, twenty twenty two, and uh, my name is Artyom Mushin Makedonsky. I'm here with you from Korolev, Russia, uh, as a member of the board of the storytelling and organizations, and we are here for yet another evening uh, with our awesome speaker, who you've probably never heard of. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> our speaker for tonight is Julian Ryan. Jules herself is going to talk to us about her new book, The Learned It in Queens Communications Playbook, and we're going to learn about why is it so important. And let's just begin by congratulating Jules on the book. I mean, it's awesome. Uh, and if you, you haven't read it yet, uh, you, you should better get into it. Uh, but uh, before we begin, well, Jules, mm -hmm. welcome. Thank you so much Thank for you. sharing with us. And um, let's make it conversational. Uh, let's not bring it to like a, like a traditional speech uh, and more uh, more anecdotes, more uh, stories coming out, and more questions from you. So uh, before we begin, Jules, would you take us on a short tour about why like why this why this book? Why why write a book in the first place? I mean, it's a lot of work. Yes. Well, first of all, the book started its life as a complaint that we had mutated its um, into head down living in a bubble species because we were all on our phones. And it started years before I even wrote a book about watching people on trains and offices about the fact that they stopped communicating. They were just not looking around, not having in-person dialogue, even when they were in the office sitting next to each other. And then at that time I was in human resources and I started to take a look at what got us into trouble? And most of the time it was because we were leaping to assumptions about what somebody said when they texted us or emailed us. And that started a whole sea chain of problems and costing us money and lawyers and all that stuff. Fast forward out of the blue, it was like one of these stories that you tell Artem or the rest of us tell about one day somebody asked me what I really wanted to do. And this man was challenging me and said, what do you want to spend your life doing? I went, I want to tell more stories and give speeches. And then a few days later, I was working with an organization and this producer showed up, this marketing guy had a crazy conversation with me and I invited him to an event I was running. And then suddenly before I knew it, he, he introduced me to a producer that was running a conference. And on the strength of no audition tapes, just on a conversation of me having running banter, they invited me to be a keynote speaker, which is surreal when you think about it. The fact that that's trust, it sounds like a fairy tale and it goes against all logic and reason. I think that woman um, who hired me, Jennifer, it, it was, um, a brave woman, but she came out of retaliality TV. So I think she knew how to build trust and find funky concepts. So fast forward, the book's concept is based on the fact of, I thought I was going to this keynote to talk to a hundred people in a small room, down a hallway, executives one-to-one, -one, a nice intimate dialogue. And then a colleague met me for breakfast one morning and said, didn't they talk to you about this event at all? You're going to be on a big stage, mega screens in front of 500 people. And I wasn't ready for that. So all I kept thinking when I was at breakfast and my coffee is they're going to hear my queen's accent. They're going to wonder why is that woman standing on the stage? She doesn't have a big book deal or title. Like, why is she here? because everybody else in that room is gonna be these top C-suite executives paying a lot of money and big titles, big names. And I'm thinking they're gonna see this short five foot two person coming and talking to them. So the book had its genesis in pure fear and panic, which is something that drives a lot of our creativity, if you're gonna be honest with yourselves. And at one point it was about, I can only show up as me, I gotta be authentic. So that was a change because when you come from New York, you don't ever want to in the past say you're from Queens or you want to say you're from New York. When you go away, you say you're from New York. And that was the first step to really owning my background. So Queens became my sidekick and became the visual prompt and how I told the story about how we screw up our communications. And it starts with us. Shocking, isn't it? It's not other people usually. It's how we're 
working. But I'm going to take a step back and let you ask the question. <laughs> so I will take it from there. Awesome. I love how it's going. Uh, oh, and Tom's here. here. He yeah, be. Tom. He's part of this story. Okay. We'll get to that. I have okay. actually come up with the, with the list of questions. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Uh, Thanks for being prepared. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I had like two minutes <laughs> as, as soon as you announced that it's going to be a QA. and a I had like two minutes to prepare. That's, um. that's a lot. I'm <laughs> nah, just kidding. So uh, I, I have this question in my mind, like, why is it essential to, uh, so, so, so important to be you? I mean, a lot of people are talking about it right now and like yeah. everyone is embracing this uh weird uh being yourself uh to the point where everyone is just you know stepping over the personal boundaries why do you feel it's important to like talk to talk more about it and how is it connected to stories i think the biggest lesson there was fine when i knew i had my own voice and i was going to play with a um, the visuals and the car you know, things I learned from growing up in Queens about communication. Part of the speech, when the speech is the genesis of the book, happened, I had to figure out a way that I could connect with the audience, no matter where they were from, what, what their ethnic background was, what their cultural background, what their political background, and it was the United States. And I don't know if you know this, but when people come from New York, people kind of look at you and go, oh, why you're here, you're gonna tell us what to do, you think you know more. So it's figuring out what did we have all in common and what do we all get in trouble? And the communications is the one thing that's very agnostic. We all mess up, we all are you know, struggling with it every day in every situation. And we have great moments, but then we stick our foot in it too quite a bit. So I think it was, what can I use that's a prompt that we can all relate to? and kind of relax and enjoy the dialogue. I don't know if I answered your question, but that was part of the driving force of little me standing on the stage going, okay, here we go. <laughs> Let's connect for 35 minutes and 40 and 45 minutes. It was a running monologue, by the way. So anyway. no, that's good. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Um, so uh, I have another one. It's actually about uh, a playbook appearing in the name, which is mm -hmm. interesting because I know that you've been doing like uh, talks and, and projects for business and for corporate, and they do not, are, are not very keen on the word play and game. It's like, you know, ah, story, play, ah, that's not us. So why playbook? When I originally did the talk, I thought that we learn better when we're having a good time and learning lessons. So I didn't want to talk at the audience, but I also know we're a very sports-minded culture. And 90% of the people I were talking to in that room were men. So I thought putting that word play of different, here's some guiding points to walk away from. And the other person I have to thank for bringing it forward into the book was Tom. And he represents another lesson that find professionals that know what they're talking about and then partially take their guidance, even though you push back and go, okay, I don't know if I agree, but part of the book's lesson too is when you collaborate find good people you trust their voice and that they're willing they're they're in your corner to champion her so tom gave an, a valuable lesson when i started to turn the speech into a book because i thought i have a speech I have great slides it was a success how long could this take but what you do on the stage doesn't always translate on the page so i had that much settled in my brain and then tom did even an amazing thing he taught me how to rethink the entire book that nearly gave me a heart attack in the beginning and then i realized he was right so um and he's here with us so thank you so the ability to take a moment pause listen to the internal dialogue going a mile a minute and then taking direction and what, um, what is the asking difference? question what is what the is difference julian between a speech and a book can you boil that? What down? works? Okay, so thank you, Carol. It's like I paid you a buck or two to ask that question. <laughs> what I realized after I had gone through my 65 saved versions of my introduction in the book that took a year and a half because I couldn't figure out where to take it was I was able to do things with my body and my voice to establish rapport on the stage within a minute or two with a couple of big visual slides. There were all pictures, it wasn't PowerPoint to establish who I was, what I was gonna complain about, and I was talking to the audience. And they had some context uh, of who I was in the introduction. That took two minutes. The intro, the people don't know me. They're like opening of the book and go, 
So you're writing a book, who cares? You know, why are you here? So I think that was the hardest part to present the introduction, what was gonna make sense of the why of the book and then ease into the humor. Now, why I had 68 versions of my intro was I kept struggling with, should I use psychology background and inform the theories behind the points I wanted to make about transference and Freud? Should I do it this way? So I kept <laughs> deleting, 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 deleting. And then the best advice someone gave me years ago, which is another storyteller named Robert Dickman, his words came back to me, a, a conversation we had, and he goes, how do you want to receive your audience and how do you want them to receive you? And that worked on the page because I thought, I want to have a conversation like I'm sitting with you and keeping it fun and light and short. And then to bounce back to Artem's question about why a playbook, most of us have attention spans of fleas right now because we're reading so much and we have so much going on to keep any little sound bites and instructions short and simple and fun with a message on each page. So you can open it up in the middle of the book and read it and learn something and at the end. So it's all about what we can do to get out of our own way and some simple things uh, that are causing it and why. But have a chuckle in the way to say, you know, she gets me, it's like she's eavesdropping. So thank you. Thank you, Carol. That was well timed. It's like we rehearsed. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> no, it's not. It's... Oh, okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, I was uh, was wondering if there are like you 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 began talking about complaints, and that just got me thinking. Um, every <laughs> author um, has this moment when reading a book or listening to someone speak at a keynote or whatever, uh, you get this this feeling like. Oh yeah, that's a way to explain this topic, but that's not how I'm going to do it because that's not mm -hmm. right. For example, I had this moment when I was reading about uh, Rob, uh, Rob Walker's experiment on the significant object when they wrote a story for different objects and then placed the objects on eBay and the objects sold for like, yes. like several times more money. And I was like, yeah, well, that's about storytelling, but it, that's actually misleading and lying to people to get their money. So that's not going to be in my book <laughs> or whatever. So that's good. But not, not so uh, did you have any moments like this? What do you mean? Standing in front of the stage? No, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean <laughs> or in the either, book? Yeah. E either on the stage or while writing yeah. a book, you were saying like, yeah, well, that could be it. Like, that's effective, but that's not how I'm going to do it. That's not that, like, that's not me. And I constantly and still constantly when I go to make a speech, it's a given. It's like almost like my prep practice, have an idea, panic, think about who's in the audience, how are they going to receive it? And then at the end, I always think, what do we all have in common and share? That's simple. We all talk to each other or to our friends. We all have meals. We all get frustrated. So what's the irony or how can we turn something around and make it anywhere? You know, anybody anywhere may have this. We all have to travel. We all have to deal with friends and bosses. So figuring out what we share more than what we're different is something I'm always asking. And where's the irony? Maybe the bubble over our heads where when we're all sitting in an audience and thinking. So Tom here, I'm going to switch gears and, and take over and put Tom on the spot. Tom here has an awesome Queens accent because when you're sharing a concept, he also had to learn how to speak in Queensite talking. So there's a whole pod of family members that helped that are out there in Ohio <laughs> that had to learn a Queens accent because Tom was the editor. He ended up being my, um, my editor on the book and it came out of an awesome conversation during COVID where he shared backstory about his work that I might not have known had not, we had not had that conversation and meeting. So it was a tipping point that the right person's there for help when you, when you need it. So thank you, shout out. You can unmute yourself, Tom, you know, show your accent, come yeah. on, show your best stuff. What are you talking about? <laughs> you gonna <laughs> eat that? <laughs> so in the beginning of the book, there's a glossary of all these terms, expressions. So I went and just played with it a bit of some of the, stereotype um, expressions that we sometimes get tone deaf in, in, in New York. Um, one of the word, the letters or words, if there's any word with an ER or EA, it's always my nemesis. Um, you know, ideas is another one here, better. 
So uh, we decided to own our uh, weaknesses and make it our strengths in this case. So back to you, Artem. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> well, let, let me just, uh, just share. Uh, so when Jules uh, shared with me that she had this book drafted and would I take a look at it? And then we went back and forth a little bit. Uh, and then I had shaped the very first introduction. And in it, she has this list of Queensite phrases uh, in a Queensite dialogue. And I had worked with her a little bit on that. And then at the dining room table with my son, who was uh, 28 at the time, uh, I just said, hey, could you read this section? Let's just see how it sounds. And then uh, my wife was there. So we were eating dinner and or it's just at the end of dinner. And he just started reading that stuff. And he, he just had so much fun with it. And I had fun listening. My wife had fun with, with it. And uh, then I was able to convey that to uh, Jules, uh, you know, this part really works well for us. We had just a lot of fun with it. And that's part of the process of mm -hmm. getting people to read it, try it, see how it uh, sits with them. Uh, so that was just a little part of the project. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for jumping in. We have a question from Carol. This is yeah, not a paid one. Um, um, <laughs> what I'm finding when, I, when I'm presenting to audience right now is life isn't fun for them. It's a little too sad, a little too scary. And so anything we can do to lighten it up really helps them listen better and learn better. Mm -hmm. And I think you hit a good point again, because I was talking to somebody in an, an interview earlier today about we're not a we're not a oblivious to all the things that are challenges that are out there, but we need some optimism and hope and positive things that help nurture us as we're moving forward to make change. And I think that's part of the message of the book is that sometimes the answers are hiding in plain sight, it's like to appreciate what we have. I would have never written this book years ago, you know, is still living in Queens, but a little distance and a little insight gave me a fresh eye of what was valuable. Just yeah. like everybody, when Tom yeah, gave yes. input, when his co my co-collaborator, the art director, weighed in with Tom to, to create the pictures or fix the pictures for the book, it was that dialogue of somebody seeing a fresh, fresh um, the, the content with a fresh eye. And the other amazing thing is when things were stalled, and they were sometimes, um, the you know people had work other projects and you're like oh this is not according to schedule another opportunity to do something different showed up i added a section about food to the book about something i wrote tom took an article and said now put it in there um one of our other fellow ex-board members trisha told me i left her flat at the end of the book at the first version yeah. that i needed to do a better editing and i was again my process is being cranky <laughs> in between going oh I thought it was done but then it ended up being a great idea so it's kind of figuring out where you have fun and taking that feedback and playing with it so it's a gift this whole book was an amazing community effort and like I said this SIO group played such a big part of it and and cheering me on and uh, the voice so it's no, really find a good team good to, sorry who's talking Roger or there's a yeah I'm sorry oh yeah hi Roger um, hey. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so, Arden, I know you you muffled. Yeah, me. Uh, yeah. We we have yet another question from Carl, if you don't mind, and then then I'm just gonna jump in. Did you do anything for your mindset before you'd start to write, so you wouldn't be into that cranky mood, and you would be <laughs> more. <laughs> It's it's a pro. I I have a running dialogue every time I do that, and I say it's my process. Now I tend to cook, I tend to walk, but cooking nothing. There's really good meals came out of that whole process because when in doubt, go dice something and splice something, and usually that's when something happened. And then a big thing about three o'clock in the morning downloads about you, you mind my own business in there sleeping. Then three o'clock, there's an idea going, ah, that might work. So it's, it's paying attention. And then um, there's a lot of very patient people who had to sit and read and listen to, 
to my monologues. <laughs> There's a special corner of heaven <laughs> of everyone who has sat through a talk. And I think we're all been part of that, you know, all the tests test people, like whether it was my father when he was alive, sitting in his chair at the nursing home, looking at me going, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's like, to like friends who gave input. So everything makes a difference and, um, and then to enjoy the process uh, along the way. So it was to hit send and to see it go live was incredible. And Tom, well, so not only was a good editor, he knew how to do stuff, which is important, like hit the upload button on the Amazon. So all is good. So anyone else? A team, you're so quiet today. You were so verbal last night in your meeting. So it's time for you to step up, <laughs> weigh in. <laughs> you see, Jules, you're taking advantage of me. You know yes. that I had a difficult time saying no to you. And so now you're going to ask me, you're going to put me on the spot. Absolutely. Give me a little time to... Yeah, well, okay, I'm gonna, okay. we'll, we'll I'm, give a team work. No, no, but I'm going to give you a, a minute too. I picked on you for yeah. a reason. But here's <laughs> the thing about what the group's about and all of you and how I've learned over the years. It's about small moments. Like my book was about being in person and the process. And I still believe that, you know, those moments where you can turn around to somebody or have a group moment, walk down the hall in a chat. But SIO was a big inspiration for me because... It showed us you can develop relationships that are meaningful and have really interesting conversations about topics, even if you haven't met people in person. And there's not one person in this group that I've met in person. So that's what it came. You know, I got was kept saying, come, come join, come on the board. <laughs> but it was about because we had good conversations. And I think that's part of what Sarah and everybody else is here. And um, it gives us hope a lot of times that we have something some people are lacking in the, that interconnection. Okay, I'm going to stop again, listen to questions. Yeah, you know, I have one um, coming up. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'm not going to skip it. Uh, and uh, I, I see you there uh, hacking with Harrison. <laughs> That's an awesome thing. <laughs> so, okay, um, you know, I, I've been like, after reading a couple of books on public speaking, there was this feeling that I had that authors that are doing books on, you know, cues how to speak. Uh, at the, at some points they they reach uh, they reach a point when they think, why isn't anyone talking about this or that? No. So is are, are there any things like that like this that happened to you that are now present in your books or in the way you speak? Like I why isn't anybody... there's. The same stories, like so many people are talking about communications and so many people are talking about authentic and the words overused now in some cases, but it was something we all recognize. I think reminding myself that I have a unique way of saying it. I, I can use my background where I grew up. I, I use my husband, the Irishman, the marriage, and that we all have a unique story to tell in our own way and appreciate that part to use irony and humor. I see great speakers all the time, but to have some fun with it and, and go back to appreciate what do I bring to the, to the table that's real and different. And the power of doing the talks, like I love entertaining and making people, helping, see, hearing people laugh, not making them laugh. But part of the things about what all of you do in your story work is when you take a step back and you, and you, incentivize people to relax and trust themselves to share a story, whether it's in a screen like this or whether it's in a group. And that's a powerful tool that not only have you entertained, you, but you've taught somebody to develop a little risk and trust in themselves that they can use their own voice. And I think that's the difference between just entertaining and then creating a community that it can engage and remember. Um, Artie, you might have this yourself or a team when you're doing groups or Tom, it's the hallway moments, you know, when somebody quotes you in another room or you see them in a parking lot, they write back and say, I still remember that talk. You know what I did because of that? I got to do X, Y, and Z, and I started to develop confidence. And to me, that's golden. That's really, really uh, an amazing um, gift back to ourselves. Awesome. Thank you for elaborating on that one. We had one question uh, from, from Hacking Boo Harrison. Hacking Boo. 
<laughs> yeah. I, well, actually, you're starting to get into some of the things that I was curious about. Story can be you know, large and small. It can be uh, prepared or impromptu. Uh, it it can be anecdotal. Just to, I, I love what you're saying. So, so with strangers, mm -hmm. you know, it can make a connection. It can deepen a connection with people you already know. So I'm just looking for some some flavor or some examples from the book. I the book's title is really intriguing to me. And and my goodness, you're right. In the head down culture, there's such a need for it. Um, <laughs> And it sounds like you're drawing people out mm -hmm. uh, and to hear their stories, which is a great connection point. So um, do not knowing how you structured the rest of this time. No, I'm, I'm starting to get the, uh, I skipped breakfast. So this is my nourishment. Oh, so thank you. Listen, from a Queen's girl point of view, food's important. The fact you gave up a meal for me, you know, we're soulmates now. That's like a real <laughs> gift. Oh my goodness. You need Postponed. to eat after this. Yes. Well, <laughs> food does lend into my next story. I, I, one of the things I talk about in the book is about being curious. Ask more one question. And when I base that question on a TV character, Columbo, who was always my inspiration for how he managed to get truth out of people in quirky ways. Last week, Wednesday, I went to a business expo. And I was like, oh, do I show up in person? Do I do more things at home? And I went. And in the what you just said about asking a question, having conversation, there was a woman from the Caribbean who, and they fed us, which was always a good thing for me. A woman from the Caribbean was doing these little coconut and mango cakes. And I asked her like, where are you from? You know, like not just where in Queens, but where are you culturally from? And she mentioned in the course of the conversation that she had done this business because of the hurricane. And it was a way of being able to support her community back home. And she shared in that conversation, she was from Dominica, Dominica, excuse me. And I said, I know one person from Dominica. His name is Steve Agar. And he's someone my husband coached in athletics like 20 years ago. Do you know she went to school with him and she ran track and field with them? And she knows another guy that went to my school and we're looking at it. And she was hopping crazy at this place. We have great pictures. I'll send it to the group afterwards. But it was like one more question. And then it opened up an amazing connection, not just like, yeah, oh, we both yeah. like food or that yeah. it was something went back. And there was another guy I found out. I was like, he looked familiar. And I knew I knew his name. And I realized I had networked with him like 20 years ago when I was reaching out with the Chinese community there. So your question about it, it's it's powerful. And we're so hungry for that now. Just we we can discover so much if we just, stop to listen and just be curious. So thank you, Hagen. You better eat something after this. You use a lot of strength. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, let, let me get, get there with another question. Um, so is there a story that you share about um, in, in your book or in or your speeches about a, a time when a successful touching to your like, like being yourself, help another person. Like you, you saw the transformation from a person doing corporate speaker mode mm -hmm. and being himself on stage. There was a moment that comes back, instantly comes back to mind. I was going to give a story workshop to a bunch of senior executives, a group of senior executives who had been in transition. They had top jobs, they had good positions, and now they were coming together, support each other in the evening. For a talk. And I gave like a very short story 101 and how to use it to introduce themselves. And one guy got up and actually took the guidance and took a risk to his peers. Because before that, it was like the Rolex sitting back, spreading, you know, doing the man moves in the room, controlled, everything was left brain. And he talked about, he was in finance, that one day he was at his desk and he was to dive into the numbers of an acquisition that they had made and then find, finding out there was some negative prime connections to some of the businesses that they had or some vestiges. And he did a running monologue in his head of cover the Wall Street Journal. This is going to be bad. Who do I need to call? And in that moment, he took, oh my goodness, I just knocked myself. Did I talk on my hands? Wait, hang on a second. Um, <laughs> bear with me. Stay away from the keyboard. Um, in that moment, he took us into his world of his monologue of mm. panic, fear, solution, what he's going to tell his boss the next day. When that happened, 
the body language shifted in the group. And then what I found out from the organizer that night in, and it sounds cliche, but it was a dark and stormy night. It was cold. It was December. It was a parking lot. All these executives, um, the organizers said, you know, usually they dive into their car. They say they're going to touch base next week. They hung out in the parking lot and talked to each other for an hour. And he goes, that never happened. So that is like, you always, I'm sure all of you have these cases in your heads you use as like prompts of like, remember that time it made a difference. Remember that time where you saw the body language shift and say me too. And there's so many that, but I, I'm using that because that was a very left brain control. These people had to be vetted to be this group. They came and gave very packaged descriptions of their updates then they start to relate to each other. And that's where the magic is. And they saw each other more human. So one person was vulnerable and made them laugh. The other person can show their hand. So I think that's an important gift to think about. We're all under the facade the same. Yeah. So thank you. Where are you, Artem? You, your screen's awesome. sh keep shifting. <laughs> the fine oh, it's, it's, just, it's because Sarah has another question for you. Sarah, go for it. Where is Sarah? Oh, there she is. She moved. Okay. So you you pretty much probably touched on this too, but my question was just about anything different or what you've learned um, after doing the book and re and talking with people and sharing what you've done, lessons learned, um, anything you would change, anything like that. There's always more things I can do in the book and book, sure. but plus playing in COVID uh, changed how to get out and talk about. But from the book, no, I think I'm very happy the way it is. And I'd like to do another one um, soon. Tom's going to go, oh my goodness. But, um, but this one about communications and food and coming together. I think what's taught me is things, based, the things are still the same. What worked in the speech a few years ago, we need to get out our own way. Um, the moments, simple moments make a difference. I call them front stoop moments, like front steps and cleans is the way we call our steps, but make a difference to connect. You can't have big conversations without sending the groundwork to have little ones and build trust. And it's, it's a human condition. So I think that's the part I learned that the book is relevant and it, it keeps being relevant. And, um, and no matter where it lands, people can relate to it because we're all trying to be a little bit better at what we're doing. So thank you for asking. How are you marketing it? How do we get the book? Is it just Amazon or? Yes, it's Amazon or you can write to me and I can send you a signed copy, but it's Amazon. Amazon, the, the champion of all things product in our country. And it's involved in, oh wait, it's available international. <laughs> So you can buy it in Europe and it's in Asia and it's funny. And so that's a whole big thing. So did you, did could, you um, self publish it or did you do yes. Amazon creator? And Tom who's sitting there was the executive editor. I had a person who was my art director for the speech. I hired him to do my slides. They collaborated on the, the pictorial part. I used my own personal photos too at one point to add. And, um, and then Tom gave me a lot of guidance and he formatted. So he is, is a treasure and a gifted listener and coach, which is what you need. And uh, is able to, you know, consulting is a wonderful gift, but he's able to hear a voice literally and truly and see where the opportunities are. So thank you, Tom. I can never, you're, I'm always talking behind your back wherever I go <laughs> about what you're able to do for me. So thank you. Do, yeah, do you, Amazon, Amazon. Do you do Amazon. that professionally then, Tom? Uh, yes. I do. It's not it? my main occupation, but came my main occupation during COVID. <laughs> I uh, wasn't able to do uh, in-person presentations hardly at all. Mm. But I, I would like to just chime in and say one uh, little anecdote about the book. Uh, mm. So in, in it, there's this one of the plays is to ask one more question. Uh, and Columbo is the uh, quintessential New York cop who uh, is, is known for asking, uh, uh, you know, just one more thing. <clears throat> and 
uh, Jules had written about that and that stuck out in my mind. And I've noticed uh, when I ask one more question, really interesting things uh, occur. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wanted to share that uh, recently I was working with a group of felons in a program that I'm part of and I do a storytelling unit with them. And there were some people who were reticent about sharing anything. Um, but we did some little section on meditation. And since we were doing meditation and concentrating on it, I don't know exactly. Uh, hey, uh, Hack and Boo, why don't you mute yourself for her? Oh, you just did done. Thing. Yeah. Sorry. Good man. Yeah. Good. Um, so, uh, in, in, anyway, we were doing something on. Uh, about breath and meditation. So I gave them a prompt, you know, tell a story of a time that breath sticks out for you. Breath had something to do with an experience you had. And they, uh, they, they told these stories about just being exhausted and couldn't breathe or being uh, surrounded. And, and it was just good. And, and just as we finished that, I thought, um, just go lean in a little deeper, ask another question. So I said, let's just do another round of, of breath stories of a time in your life that breath mattered. And then this one guy shared this story about a drug overdose of this girl that he was with and she stopped breathing and he had to do mouth to mouth and cardio, you know, just save her life and called the EMT, you know, and so it's just, he just opened up this huge level of saving someone's life. And then the next guy shares a story about him just getting out of prison, not wanting to be involved in drugs anymore, but a friend just kind of deceived him and suddenly he shot up and he OD'd and he died. Um, and so he told the story of him being revived and coming back in, into the world uh, on a gurney in the hospital. Uh, and then the other guy shares that he was the one who gave the drugs to the other person who died. <laughs> the, the level of sharing that happened in that moment just because I asked the question, let's do another round of breath stories, just one more time, was just absolutely phenomenal. It was one of the deepest sharings that I've ever experienced with these guys. Uh, and I have Jules to thank for it, for putting it in her book, you know, just reminding us, ask one more question. And that's a little story that comes out of the book. And thank you. And the listening awesome. to your, your gut. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. That was awesome. Uh, Carol, just a sec. We had the long-awaited question from a team. That was actually yes. requested by Jules, so a team, go for it. <laughs> this is just a comment. Um, I, I've been, no, 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 I have the floor now, Carol. Okay. Yeah. Thank I'm you. Sorry. I've been waiting patiently. Okay. Thank you. Because whenever I get a tasking from Jules, <laughs> I try and get on it right away. You know, if she oh thinks so highly of me, I, you know, I want to try and keep my stock up with her. Thank you, Carol. I get you. So, the truth of the matter is, I've been giving a lot of thought lately to paradox. And I've been telling people that wisdom resides in paradox. And I'm curious as to whether you've dealt with that subject at all in this book. And if so, would you please share with us an example of that? Well, the paradox is for me is there's so many ways we could use our brain and, and explain things in very left brain process to show statistics, to show data, to show you all the information that's out there, the why we should be looking up and the neural parts of you know what happens to our brain and story. But the paradox is like, what do we really pay attention to sometimes? Are we open to just having a conversation and a laugh and sometimes remembering uh, like a small sharing that will stay with us just much longer and the lesson will stay with us much longer than 
all the data and the theory in the world. And I'm not disputing the intellectual part. And trust me, in the after the book, I realized I started to study more of the neuroscience of story work. Yeah. But I think it's giving us learning prompts. And, and my joke to a team, and thank you uh, for saying this, when we're in a bind where we're going to be, we feel ourselves like um, reacting and getting locked into an emotional reaction to something what somebody said, whether it's a relative or a friend or a business, and it's, a, you know, it's trigger a button that could be historical or something. None of us have time to read the PowerPoint and the book and say, wait, I know that book's on my shelves. <laughs> Let me go. So part of the book was to do almost like Pavlovian Rorschach test to say couple of visuals, couple of like headline things to help interrupt us and stop. And I can tell you, it, I use it. I use it for me. And we teach what we want to learn from ourselves, I believe. And I did this as much for me as anybody else. So I think the paradox is sometimes to just trust the natural, your, our natural intelligence. And sometimes what we need is something simple. And I think that's part, just to meet people where they are and, and keep it simple and um, not over-engineer everything. So, thank you, Gitti. That was a great question. And we had a comment from Carol. This is, this is kind of off in left field, but what I've noticed is I've been going to in-person celebration of life of people that have died. Okay. And it is so much more powerful, the speakers, when they talk the stories of the person than when it was on Zoom. Mm. You know? it, it, there's something about a community coming together to honor and um, they get out of the left brain and, and uh, it's, it's just so much more moving. Yeah, I, I think celebration. Look, a few weeks ago, I went to a client of mine who graduated from Yale School of Management. And you know, on that day, as was the president and all these professors, and you know, they went through a hundred zillion graduations in their time. But in that purpose, too, another milestone, a graduate, you could feel a palpable energy in the air that this was something different. We haven't done this in two years. The graduates, one of mine, she just had a baby, and I was. I shouted out because I didn't realize she was bringing the baby on stage. <laughs> and she's and the, and the dean announced and she had a little papoose that Cooper's here. And I was like, how awesome. But people were showing up and saying, you know what? I waited two years. I'm going to bring my kid with me to show that I got my master's. I got my doctorate and have them part of it. And that might not have happened a few years ago. So I think people are taking opportunities with the mourning and the passing of someone we love to transition and say, we're gonna own this moment and really take it up a notch and just take, put a different special energy and appreciation into it. And it keeps coming up in conversation no matter where I've been lately. So Carl, good good thinking from. Um, awesome. Yeah. Jules, I have like one, um, not, not a typical question. You know, an author is usually asked like, who should read your book? But I would phrase it differently. <laughs> who shouldn't read your book? Who should? Like, who, you will like never recommend like you, you man. No, not for you, man. You know what? It, it it's the hardest question because I know in America the land of the marking is supposed to have a niche, and I keep thinking it's really for everyone who's willing to take a chance and have a moment to listen. So I think maybe not so much for teenagers, but from young adults on, like you know, merging professionals. Oh come on! There, there, really... should, there should be someone who isn't ready, like. Go for it. Another grumpy person. <laughs> so, but I think, I don't know. I That's it's, a, it's an interesting question. I will text you after my problem. I answer at three in the morning. Thank you. But I think it speaks to everybody. We all communicate as all human. And um, it's anyone, anywhere that's willing to take a laugh in a moment uh, to just kind of visit me in my, my history and um, be open to changing. And taking a chance and look at how they approach their communications. So thank you, Art. That's an interesting question. What's my niche? Who should come? I'm kind of like inviting everybody to the front stoop to join me in learning and listening. Awesome. I love I like the like the broader niche. I'm not a fan of this <laughs> the entire globe. Myself. You know, all right, maybe a few aliens of you know out of space if they're around. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I should get subtitles. <laughs> how, how are you going to market it? What's your marketing plan? I've been, Mari, it's a long, long, long country road. It's been a lot of um, virtual talks, 
for a good part of COVID, um, getting invited to show up at different conferences. I've given conferences and workshops where the book gets mentioned or sometimes incorporated. A lot of times I'm spinning off a concept. I have shown up in real time human uh, time, three dimensional humans, remember those, they walk and talk. I've done that in live groups and um, usually I reference it. I don't believe in in your face marketing, but I think wherever I can talk and then I bring it with me, <laughs> so, it's like, you know, and like, by the way, I have a book. Um, so it, it's funny. And then people are promoting it too, and they're giving it shout outs and talking about it on their own podcast. So that's been a gift. What I think COVID taught us is to be bolder and to realize we have to show up in different ways, even though we're uncomfortable. But I'm still learning and if, um, how to do more of this and um, plan to have some fun. What I'm hoping for, if we can keep everything under control, is to be more events in Queens and Metro New York and other places to do and start to do more live small group events to teach some of the elements of storytelling and connecting with groups. So yes, have, have book will travel. That's a hint, guys. Spread the word. We have another one for Boo. Go for it. You're on mute. Yeah, that's my that's uh, my deal. Yeah, <laughs> I've got the mug. You're on mute. Uh, so you referenced in our banter at the beginning of the hour about the generations, but you also talked about the different cultures and backgrounds and whatnot. And we've seen lots of research about the younger folks, heads down, don't have a lot of, aren't as skilled at, at the natural social interaction. Do you have um, tips or approaches when you are trying to connect with people of like the digital generation uh, that uh, to draw them out uh, and separate them from their, um, you know, uh, intense love affair with their devices. I mean, I, I'd be curious to hear about um, just any different approaches or, or wonderful uh, questions or, or access uh, uh, ways yeah. to connect with. Yeah, you got it. Okay. I am. Um... I use my family and friends as beta, beta groups. Um, there's been a lot of young people. I think start with where they are and appreciate them and take an interest in them first and what's what's on their mind and what they're up to. And tell, tell like share anecdotes of how you failed and successful and little things you learned along the way and keep it short and simple, but engage them in the conversation. Um, we have a couple of nieces and nephews that are now college age but they would show up at the table. I mean, one of the good things about being married an Irish person is they like telling stories and they're big about gathering around the table. And I think that informs us. If you invite people in or if they're in earshot, it, it works. A lot of my story work started in an office. I didn't know it was story work. I just thought I had no budget. I had to talk to people and find out <laughs> how to get them to tell me about themselves. So a lot of my basic storytelling skills before I knew the science behind it was just instinctually like being curious about them and taking an interest and keep coming back to them. So I think relationships are not a, are, are built on not just a one on done. It's a series of small interactions if you're gonna engage uh, young people and make it interesting. Um, there are, as sometimes I know there's a big use of um, audio visuals and movies and that can be so creative. Um, find out how people wanna tell their story and let them go at it. There's no right or wrong way. I think as long as they're sharing their truth and showing a bit of themselves, that's exciting. And then show me how you did it because I want to learn too. So thank you. That's a good question. And um, being nosy, I think that's a skill. It's curious nosy. <laughs> and not letting them get away with just like a grunted answer. So open-ended questions and then just being curious and um, not giving up, I think too, is my strategy. It's nothing that I can patent or have a metric, but it's worked and it's still working. So thanks. A quick related question. Do you have a magic time frame for a certain kind of story? I mean, do you do you find meeting strangers that, you know, a, a 90 second story, not not precisely like Toastmasters timing it, but do you, have mm -hmm. you found that at different types of conversations or different environments, a different duration of story is is appropriate or? Yes. I mean, I've been teaching some of this with people in career transition. They're using stories for interviews. And I make the analogy right. of like, just like you have the 30 second spot or the 10 second spot. 
Um, you have to pick and choose the detail you use in the story, what your listener is expecting and why you're telling the story. Like I got trained in narrative methodology, know your why, know your end game and why. And it doesn't belong because a lot of times I have great things I want to share in a speech or tie. And it's like, I say the throw it off the boat. Great metaphor, don't need it here. And the other part is we <laughs> originally did, I did an interview with Jerome DeRoy and our, uh, Dr. Brian Grolowski who talks to the R question. And he has this great model because he's saying metaphor is the cousin of story. And sometimes you can use a metaphor to bring you along to inform who you are. And sometimes all you need is data. People don't want the Iliad, you know, in certain comments. They want to know a fact and an information. So picking and choosing your audience and saying, why am I telling the story? Is it just because I want to hear my own voice or I'm trying to engage? So there has to be a purpose. And, um, and sometimes it's more about listening and letting them just share. So yeah, it's a good question. If there's no art in rigid science. I think that's it. But when you have somebody going cross-eyed and falling asleep, maybe that's that's, like, that's or shifting it. There are some times there's clues, you know. Maybe we are tight up the pitch here a bit, but um, and just waiting and listening and seeing what how that person's experiencing what you're sharing. So and then learning because whatever we do, we can use it for the next talk and say, well, there's a case study I have from when it did work, and here's why it did. So we have that power to replay and repurpose all our mistakes and our disasters uh, forward for the greater good of humanity. Awesome. If anyone else has any comments or questions on the book, yes, Carol, I feel like you're <laughs> meeting Are it. you using, Julian, are you using your contacts and human resources uh, to get some, some of the trend centers to know about your book? and uh, maybe going to conferences, doing, because um, it, it seems to me there, there's a lot of challenges for human resource professionals right now. <laughs> yes, yes and, like they say in improv class, yes and. So, and one of the things too, because I, I, I always have like a list of things that I'm doing and what I need to do next and it's days aren't long enough. But one of the things too, I was very conscious of is during COVID so much, of our world it was in crisis mode and just figuring out hybrid, figuring out how to do. So slowly, surely people were in a position and a mindset that they could start to think. I mean, I worked with one client this year on a great project where they were doing memorable moments of things they captured for their staff rather than just reporting in a report of here's achievements, here's data. They start to collect stories in the organization work through a bit by bit and report back. So as they shared, it could be just a simple moment, like this person called me and it wasn't their project and they offered to help. 20 second example that really drove a message. But what happened in the sharing and the facilitating of that event, the whole community got to hear what was valued, what was important and acceptable. But they weren't doing that at the beginning COVID. Like they were at a certain point, they said, now it's time for a look back. And then my job facilitating was to do little mini vignettes at the beginning, tie bows around what we had learned the, the prior time because it was a series of events, and then put some rhyme or reason around what we're doing next and figuring what will land. And I didn't know the stories before I heard them. So that was kind of another example of you learn as you go, literally, in some of these Zoom situations or facilitate. So yes, Carol, yes. And if you have friends in HR, please tell them. Uh, about me as well. So get the word out constantly. And on podcasts, do that. Where do I forget what I do? I've been doing series of podcasts about this as well. So more, I think, is the name of the game right now. So thanks. You want to be my agent, Carol? You're very good. So uh, and Shannon, I didn't get a chance to say hi and welcome mm -hmm. and Norman. So um, since we have Aloha and Roger. So thanks very much for coming. That means a lot. In Minnesota now, they will let an author go to a public library, give a talk, and then you can sell your books and sign them there. Do you have that in New York? We have library. I was at libraries, but I was in screens. I, I traveled around Queens and New York and a few other places. <laughs> so so I, I, I'm like I said, we're gradually reaching out. People, they've done things in public, but they're gradually rebooting the in-person situation. 
And that's the other thing. Uh, what I learned is you don't want to do hybrid. You want to do all or nothing, all hybrid, all virtual or all in person if you want to keep your sanity during the presentation. <laughs> just, just, if I can share anything <laughs> with all of you guys, live matters to be in the room and not going, hi, hi, <laughs> during the whole session. So yeah, live is cool. Live, it, live has a special plus to it, so thanks. Anyone else? Yes, I, um, Craig, I do have my book book there. Um, is it, there's a live of, person of my my old staff person, one of my old staff is featured in the book. It would make a great Zoom backdrop for one of your uh, online programs to have you framed in the stoop. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna. Love, I'd love. Yeah. I'm gonna talk to an art friend of mine and put her to work because uh, that's been on my list. So thank you. That's an excellent suggestion. That's been long waiting. Okay, so mm -hmm. we're nearing the uh, last couple of minutes. So I have like this follow up question. So after writing this book, um, how did it change the way you approach communication? Because I mean, when finishing writing the book, you feel like, oh, now it's done. But then you feel, God damn it, I could have said <laughs> this. Now I understand this better. So what's your transformation journey after writing it? The transformation after writing the book was the getting it done and putting it in print. The most important transformation was the initial genesis when I stood in front of a group of 500 people and owned who I was and where I was from and owned my voice. And that changed everything and gave me much more confidence in how I relate to others and connect. And it just, it was just like a huge, like I say, vitamin of saying, I can be exactly who I am and it's fine. I don't need to be this left brain, you know, no emotion. Because that's why I used to think that's what, it, you know, America's looking for. And I was like, I can be me. I can be me. So I think that's the gift. And it came with time and perspective. Like a lot of writers who left the country to go look at a different country, I just crossed the bridge. And then when I look back, I start to appreciate, I learn things. And there's always something we can learn from tough situations or challenging situations, there's always something we can play forward. And I think that was the gift um, that I took away from, so thank you. Do you think there's a feminization of our culture that feelings are more accepted than they used to be? I would say yes. Mm -hmm. Boy, you keep us on our toes, Carol. It's like, <laughs> but I'm about from Queens. We always talk with our hands. I don't understand this. <laughs> We had emotion. We were good. <laughs> we never thought this through. <laughs> That's what I notice when I travel. Like, if people don't emote or feed me a lot, I'm like, really? Is this how you work every day? How is this possible? Awesome. So, Artem, I, God bless I, I, you. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> he's, just like, he's like a therapist. I see. <laughs> So yeah, well, with the campfire. Tell me more. Yes, yes, yes. Like, you how are you pipe. feeling you about need a pipe. <laughs> And a glass of whiskey next to it. If I get a pipe, I will get banned from my house because of, <laughs> because of the smell. So okay. yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a free man anymore. So, yeah, okay, yeah. anyway. <laughs> do, you, do you know how to get your book into airport bookstores? Because there's a lot more travel going on now and people are looking for things to do on the airplane rather than to talk to each other. You know, I am mass looking shop. for a way of doing that mass shipping. It okay, let's, yeah. let, let's yeah, go yeah, for yeah, it. Yes. Thank you, Artem. Let's go for one final question. Um, what would you advise for people who are sitting down to write a book on speaking or anything else? Start, show up, find other humans that are writing as well, find a community. Before I did this, I was working on a couple of other things. So start to stretch your voice and just practice and get feedback. There are people that have a really wonderful sense of themselves and are in it to learn and support you. And I think I had a small writing group that um, made a big difference to listen and give input. So I think that sense of community and trying and practicing. So I would test things out in like conversations, a line or two, or bring it up in conversation. So just practicing what I'm writing as I'm doing. So we're like a lot of unsuspecting test market was done, but keeping it real, like don't over engineer, trust your gut. 
I think, you know, if you, especially if you're doing something more conversational and true to your own experience. Ah, another fan. He's so cute. He's so big. Like, <laughs> he's probably too young for your book, but he said he wanted to say hi. Oh, thank you. you. Thank question. you. Ah, that's a good, that's having... a good cue for, for all of us to yes. take a break. <laughs> yes. And then we have a couple of things we're going to talk about. Yeah, them, right? Yes. Right, arm, just, right arm. Just as a, just as a host, <laughs> I just wanted to remind you that uh, you, you can you can check your membership, uh, and uh, we all have our dues to pay, and you know what I mean. So uh, just you know, just make sure that uh, we, we receive your um, uh, money for the membership. And, and uh, we are looking for new members. Oh, you are looking for new members of, of the board, so you can always. Oh, he just said, have a good uh, oh, thank day. you. So, thank you. <laughs> so we're looking for new members of the board if you would like to apply. And, you know, if you know anyone who would fit the community and does storytelling in organizations, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. And they and, don't need uh, to be storytellers. They can just be young people, up and coming people who can do um, help with social media, help a group. Exactly. Make a great thing on your resume. Go find these people that are looking something else. And the last thing I want to say, you know, we're going to put where to find my book on my site, but a team to say thank you to a team for doing everything she's done as being wise counsel. Her role is changing. She's still being part of us, but she's stepping off the board. But I wanted to just use this moment recorded as a moment of record to say thank you for being such a bright light and spirit and introducing us to so many new people along the way and building community. So thank you. My pleasure. So what's next? What do we got planned for the fall? No, I'm not sure. We, we sure are going to have this new lab in, in July. Uh, we'll probably find a speaker uh, or not. So <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll just be in touch and uh, we'll get to you in, in an email, uh, in a newsletter as always. So thank you for being with us. Jules, thank you for the terrific talk uh, thank and you. reflection and on the book. Great interview and all of your great interviewers. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Tom, thank you for taking the gift of time and showing up. And just look for me out there. Okay. Cheers, guys. Bye. Thank, thank, thank you, Julie.